Welcome everybody to this uh, afternoon uh, session on COVID-19 and uh, the future of uh, work. I'm very uh, pleased uh, to welcome four uh, distinguished uh, speakers uh, on uh, the uh, panel in uh, alphabetic order. It's uh, Nobuya uh, Haraguchi from UNIDO. He heads the Research and Industrial Policy Advice Division there. UNIDO is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and so I understand he's sitting in Vienna. Then we have uh, Sanjita Korana from Bournemouth University, a professor of economics uh, there and a trade and development uh, specialist. We have uh, Francois, Francois Lafont from University of Oxford. He's uh, the deputy director of the Complexity Economics Program and uh, a lead researcher at the related Institute for New Economic Thinking of the University of Oxford. And last but not least, Aurelio Parisotto from uh, ILO, a senior economist of the Policy Integration Department um, of that institution, that common institution in, in Geneva. Now, um, the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, impacts uh, upon many ways, in the way that production is organized and the way in which uh, consumption takes place. Um, there has been a lot of reliance, and that's what we do at the moment, uh, on remote work and an increased use of automation technologies in many sectors, allowing firms to maintain and increase uh, production levels uh, in the face of social uh, distan distancing and strict lockdowns. On the consumption side, there has been an increased use of e-commerce. Yes, and well, um, there is a lot of uh, expectation now go how long this all goes on. And uh, well, my guess is uh, the pandemic will not leave us very fast, uh, at least not in a very complete way. So the interesting thing is now how um, this uh, big shock uh, impacts uh, on uh, what we are doing and how we do it on the labor market and with human resources. Um, and how uh, long-lasting uh, these impacts uh, will be and how much they, uh, these, these impacts support uh, past um, uh, uh, trends uh, which we have seen or even stop them. Now, what we uh, do in this uh, session is uh, that we first ask all the panelists uh, to present what they think is the most important uh, issue from their side in a short statement. Then we, uh, in the second part, we will exchange a few opinions on critical issues. And at the end, uh, we um, invite uh, the wider audience uh, we have here for questions. Of course, I invite everybody already now to write in potential questions we should discuss uh, um, in the in the chat um, at the right hand side. Now, um, let me uh, ask the general starting question to the panel. Where do you see COVID-19 uh, as a major game changer for the future of work? Uh, for what will run, uh, run differently? And I ask this first to uh, uh, Mr. Haraguchi. Uh, Nobuya, what is your opinion on this? Thank you, Klaus, uh, for your introduction. Um, as we know, the COVID-19 had severe economic and social impacts on the world. Projected decline in global GDP growth in 2020 is 6.6%, .6 the deepest global recession in 70 years. Projected decline in global working hour is around 9%, and projected increase in global extreme poverty is around 15 percentage points. This is equivalent to 97 million more people living in extreme poverty due to the pandemic. But these aggregate numbers mask significant differences in the impact across and within countries. The decline in economic activity, of course, closely correlates with the severity of the pandemic 
and stringency of countries' containment measures, but also structural characteristics of countries, such as size of domestic market, level of integration to the global economy, and composition of the economy have all made differences in the impact on industry and farm performances. While negative impacts will rescind as economies recover, some of the changes introduced during the COVID are likely to stay or will be even more prominent in the future. Before the onset of the pandemic, we have witnessed some megatrends such as digitalization, climate change, geographical shift in production location. The pandemic will not change these megatrends, but it is likely to accelerate the pace of these trends. At UNIDO, we conducted farm level surveys in developing countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. We collected uh, around 4,000 responses in total. For example, on average, 15 to 25 percent of farms introduced new technologies and equipment to automate their production during the pandemic. And 70 to 85 percent of them indicated that changes will stay in the future. Also, the volume of global investments for sustainability increased by 40 percent from 2019 to 20. Manufacturing farms um, um, manufacturing firms in developing countries expect the pandemic to accelerate the adoption of economic, uh, sustainably uh, environmentally friendly technologies. In a sense, the pandemic imposed us to have a social and economic experiment, which revealed further existing divides, gaps, and inequalities, and let us learn what is possible or works under the megatrends of our time. This is a reason why the pandemic will accelerate megatrends. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you. Now, Sanjita, what's, what's, your, what's your view on this? Thank you so much, uh, Klaus, for having me on this panel. And um, it's a great opportunity um, to discuss a little bit about what we have been doing. Uh, the past few months since the pandemic hit. So with regards to the question you had about um, the impact on work, I think it's really very important to contextualize that COVID-19 has actually increased and reinforced the inequality dynamics. And basically, as you rightly mentioned, it's caused the uh, digital transformation of production, uh, commerce and work to accelerate. Now, clearly what has happened is, is it was alluded to that smaller firms have struggled, but the larger ones, which are the more advanced firms, but they have actually increased the market share and they have fortified the shift more towards an oligopolistic and a less competitive market structure, unfortunately. And this has only been possible because of um, increased automation in, and, and teleworking. What has happened is that this has tilted the labor market against low skilled, low wage workers. So, and this has also had a very negative impact on gender um, um, in terms of employment, because now what we see is that the distribution has shifted. Uh, so the distribution of both capital and labor income has, has been unequal and the income has actually shifted from labor to capital. So this basically underlines that we cannot look at the impact of the, the employment impact of the pandemic without looking at the gender impact. Another important point I think which we need to highlight is that um, COVID-19 has had a profound impact on uh, work, on where people work. It has basically altered fundamentally the understanding of what work is performed and how we perform it. So basically, businesses are looking now um, to retrain, reskill um, their workforce because it's really very important to identify where the gaps lie in terms of skills. So I'll stop here. I'll let the other panelists come in and I can discuss a little bit more about country specific differences. Thank you.
Yes, thank you, thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, now, Francois, what's your what's your particular view? Um, hi. So, thanks, Klaus, for the nice introduction and for the invitation. Um, so, I really liked how the question was phrased because it was about uh, how our expectations about the future have been changed by um, by COVID. And so, I, I agree with Nobuya that you know there were those mega trends and. Um, and they're here to, to stay, uh, but the question is whether COVID has accelerated them uh, or not. So I thought I would pick uh, one of them in particular, which is the, the sustainability transition. And so I think there are two, two questions. The first is how do we expect the sustainability transition to affect the future of work? And the second is whether or not COVID has, has accelerated um, this, this transition. So, um, what do we need the sustainability, the sustainability transition to achieve and what does it mean for labor markets? Well, it's a big challenge to take the, so the UK as an example, uh, a prominent recommendation is to reduce emissions by 60% between 2019 and 2035. So 60% in 16 years. And in the case of the UK, it cannot come just from low hanging fruits because most of the coal plants have been, have been closed already. So it's really about changing large parts of the economy. Uh, so electricity generation for sure, but also transport, manufacturing, mining, construction, agriculture, and the many jobs in supporting services that need to become greener. So you know, green finance and circular economy training for executives and, and stuff like that. So where are those green jobs? Um, it's difficult to, to define them. Um, there's the sort of broad definition from ONET that, that is becoming popular. Um, and it seems if you take that, that green occupations are overrepresented in groups that are intensive in uh, uh, abstract tasks. So because business managers will need to upskill to become greener. And there's also a lot of green jobs in manual routine tasks. So uh, construction, maintenance, mining, and there will there will be a need for upskilling there. So are these green jobs different? Um, apparently, yes. If you take within an occupation and you compare the, the, the green version and the less green version of basically the same occupation, you find that green jobs tend to be a bit more abstract and require more education uh, and more experience. So basically, the sustainability transition will imply a substantial transformation of the economy with new occupations, uh, a lot of transition, retraining, and upskilling. So we're we are waiting for that. Now the question is, did COVID accelerate this? Um, if you take as the engine of this transition fiscal policy and you ask, OK, uh, with all these huge budgets that have been spent and, and borrowed, incidentally, um, um, are, they, are they green? Will they accelerate the sustainability, tr sustainability transition? It was a massive opportunity. And the consensus is no, no, it doesn't. Um, so for instance, if you take uh, the Global Recovery Observatory at Oxford, they estimate that the total spending is around 20 trillion, which is a quarter of world GDP. And out of that, 15% uh, is about investment rather than rescue. And only 2.5% is, is green. So it's, it's, it's almost nothing. Um, just a couple of quotes. There's a separate entity, uh, Vivid Economics, that, um, um, and I quote uh, also as a report saying, the announced stimulus to date will have a net negative environmental impact in 15 out of 20 economies. Because just doing a few green things, if you also subsidize the dirty things, just doesn't add up. Another source is the International Energy Agency. Um, we also find, you know, 2% of total spending is for clean energy. Uh, but what they find is that in 2023, emissions will be at record levels. They will keep rising after that. And yes, they are 800 million tons lower than they would have been without the effort, but they're still 3,500 uh, million tons above the, where they should be to reach the uh, 1.52 degrees uh, uh, goal from, from, from the Paris Agreement. So basically, I, what I would say is that the, 
uh, the sustainability transition as we need it would be a game changer for labor markets, but so far it's not on track and it's not been accelerated by COVID, although uh, I'm sure there are differences in developing countries and, and in specific firms and so on. Well, Francois, thank you very much. Good points. Um, we have to discuss them. Aurelio, are you a little bit more optimistic than the others? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, you and Merit, for organizing this session and for inviting us. I think this is a really an important topic. And well, the question of green job has been a long standing flagship of the ILO. But I, I would like to start with a common sense observation. And it, it is that the the future of work is what we are able to make of it. It's not determined by technology or by the market, but depends on the policy that we are capable of, to, of putting in place. So the concern I would like to raise, which was echoed by colleagues before, is that of deepening inequalities because of the pandemic. And in particular, that those deepening inequalities can become entrenched and lead to polarized economic and, and, and labor market structure. And this can lead to sharp divides in politics and in society, so uh, fueling populism or na economic nationalism. So in a, in a nutshell, it would make it more difficult the task of shaping a better and more sustainable future world. So of, of an undertaking uh, environmental responsible fiscal policy, for example. So I think this is, is particularly important for, for me. How is COVID-19 playing a role? I mean, it was mentioned before, uh, there's clear evidence that those who are more vulnerable on the labor market has been more deeply affected. So unemployment, inactivities, poor working conditions, insecurity have increased for women, young workers, uh, uh, informal workers, migrants, but I think also for low-skilled workers, so, so adult, white, and, and, and workers that have experienced stagnant wages for about two decades in, in the past. So many have become detached from the labor market. It will take time to get them back. But I've also mentioned there's another dimension of increasing inequality, which is across countries. So for the poor economies, the impact has been devastating because they did not have the fiscal resources for massive relief programs like in the advanced economy. So there are, there are two levels of increasing inequalities. The some perhaps not too good news is if we look at the recovery, which is ongoing, uh, which is strong for GDP in some countries. But if we look at the labor market, the new jobs are not of a great quality. And particularly in the many developing countries, we have evidence in Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, the new jobs are mainly in the informal economy. So formal sector jobs are hard to come, are difficult to come. If we look at advanced economy, where there's been a really amazing supply side response and the major shift to automation, uh, telework, uh, artificial intelligence, we really it helped the recovery very, very strongly. But on the labor market, many of the jobs like you know, digital platform are actually of very poor quality. So young people are trapped in, you know, very unclear activities with very unclear contractual arrangements and new model of work uh, where it's not clear the, the boundaries between risk, responsibility, and uh, rewards. So this is a bit of concern, I think, in, in a sense. And the other, just another point, uh, if we look at the shape of the economic recovery, for those who have assets, uh, they've been en en you know, enjoying benefits from booming stock exchange market, increase in housing market, etc. This is a global economic crisis where the number of uh, bankruptcy of firms uh, and the, the volume of uh, non-performing bank loss has actually decreased. So it's a, the, 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 there's a two-track recovery. So on the financial side, it, it is doing quite uh, well. On the labor market side, it is not doing quite well. Uh, what can be done, I'm sure we're going to discuss about policy, and so I don't want to enter into that. Just I would like to say that you know, there's not a single, there's not a silver bullet, there's not a single solution. We, we have to think in terms of complex policy packages that are adapted to the political attitude and preferences of each country. Sorry for taking so long, but thank you for the occasion. No, no problem. I think, thank you very much, Aurelio. Now we have a very broad picture, of course. Uh, many issues.
questions which have to be uh, put into pieces to be handle them uh, in the panel. So let us go through uh, what you said, uh, you all said um, in, in steps, hopefully. Um, let's start with the idea what happens uh, to, let's start, let's say, above global. Um, what's, what, what does this mean now for globalization, labor mobility and remote work? Will remote work stay or will, will we, if you have a chance, just we, we go back? Um, and uh, well, looking back to history, looking at what happened after the Spanish flu at the beginning of the last uh, century, a very globalized world uh, stopped uh, at, at the being of, of the world, uh, I, in my view, yes, uh, in particular migration at that time, yes, as, as, we, as you all know. Will, will history repeat? I mean, uh, what, is, uh, what is your view on the panel? I mean, intervene as you want, and we don't have to all answer, but uh, if you want, please go ahead. Who would like to respond to this issue? Yes, uh, please go ahead, Nobuya. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for posing the uh, very important question. Um, I think uh, in, on the production side, uh, farms which are exposed to especially global value chains and foreign trade have been uh, severely affected due to the uh, uh, value chain disruption and so on. So that uh, uh, might affect in the future in terms of how they will uh, reorganize their production. Maybe we will have more regional global value chains or importance of domestic production and capabilities uh, might increase. Uh, it's not still certain yet, uh, but uh, this is the only possibility. But what we uh, started seeing is that uh, diversification of supply sources. That is, uh, we have already witnessed uh, in order to to secure uh, uh, um, sources uh, in, in during the time of the similar crisis in order to continue the production. And that is uh, what is uh, uh, happening right now uh, in, in industries. Thank you. Anybody, anybody else uh, interested in that topic? Yeah, so just, just to say um, uh, something about remote work. So, so I, I don't know whether it will stay, but first of all, it's uh, maybe a third of the jobs, uh, depending on the countries, of course, but it's hardly a, a, a majority. That said, um, um, if some of the work from home can, can stay, it, it does have a few channels through which it can have beneficial environmental effects. Uh, just because people don't travel, uh, offices might not be uh, might not need to be uh, hit, and um, um, some firms are starting to limit international travel. Um, but who is it? Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. I mean, it, it's one side. We have to see that not all jobs uh, can be easily done from home or from from far away. But also, I mean, since I'm in this business for longer, uh, two de decades ago, there was uh, maybe if you went to computer uh, 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 events, fairies, uh, uh, and, and future congresses and whatever, everybody was speaking about the next, uh, next uh, very soon, we would all stay with our laptop somewhere. We will not work in a specific office, but from home, on the street, or anywhere else. And um, for decades after, I guess, 20, I have seen it and I've observed it, nothing really happened, at least not very strong. So, uh, so the question is, is it now really different? Um, and uh, given, and we will come back to that issue, uh, what you mentioned, Francois, that um, we, uh, we, we are not investing really uh, in the future at the moment. Uh, we are not restructuring. This is our next issue in a way. Yes, it's not. Um, with, with no restructuring uh, going on uh, in a significant way, why would all this change? Um, is anybody else, I mean, uh, already uh, maybe also this next issue, um, uh, uh, will we fall back? And what is about quality of work? Digitalization and automation, will this go on faster or, or is it just um, moving on slower as it was? 
Aurelie, what is your opinion on that? Oh, well, maybe just one quick comment on the on the structural change, on the acceleration in the structural change. I think it was already mentioned by Nobuya, but there are quite a number of survey of, of enterprises, of employers, the World Economic Forum has carried out quite a number, where there really, there really is a strong interest and, and strong investment by, by employers in the new technologies, in, 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 in the new way of working. And if I also think of some survey of workers about uh, do they prefer to work uh, at home or in the office, that also you know gives me that impression that there is some some propensity, some preference for for you know more digitalized form of work. Uh, we have some concern because so far the 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 platformization of work has been associated with not very satisfactory working condition. And so this is something that has to be tackled in terms of policy. I just wanted to make one comment. You mentioned the question of migration. I think that the, the, the drivers there are uh, the sharp difference in demographic growth across countries. Uh, which are really the re really quite quite important. So, uh, my migration uh, mobility across uh, borders may decline, may be more difficult, may be subject to health and passport controls or any other. But they already controls. So, but the pressure will be there. Uh, we doing some work on the LDC, so the the, the 40, 40, 49 uh, poorest countries in the world. So, in by twenty fifty. One out of four of the young people, between 15 to 24, will be born in an LDC. We will be born in a poor country. So they will be born in a situation where the opportunities you have locally are really not very promising. So I think this is something we should take into account. Yeah, I think the, you're, right, you're right. The demographic differences, let, let's say, take the continent Africa versus Asia and, and, and Europe, then one can easily see there is such a huge difference in, uh, in, in, in growth of population um, where, where Europe and Asia, maybe excluding India, losing losing jobs. Um, losing people, uh, whereas uh, in, in, in Africa, people are searching for jobs. That certainly will be so strong that there will be, I agree with you, I mean, massive uh, migration uh, flows, uh, which uh, uh, well, cannot be stopped, even with the new experiences uh, of, uh, of border control and that entire countries, yes? I mean, closing the borders, uh, like we have seen in the pandemic, was not... Uh, a realistic picture, but obviously somehow, not really, but somehow we can do it for a shorter period in some ways. Now, uh, well, the issue of inequality has been mentioned a few times uh, uh, between between you on the panel. Uh, is there just the old inequality uh, or is there something like a new inequality coming from uh, the uh, challenges initiated by uh, COVID-19, so let's say those who are able to work from home uh, are allowed or able and can do it from the job and others who are not, uh, just as an example, or those who have not access uh, to uh, uh, technologies. Uh, because on the other side, uh, I mean, uh, the new technology is also a chance for for for, for developing countries uh, to, um, to uh, 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 Bring uh, the capacities in, yes, through through, through the internet and um, uh, the, the work there. Uh, what what do you think about um, the situation? Is there a new inequality? Yes or no? I mean, Sanjita, what's your opinion? You spoke about gender, yes. Um, well, but we, yes, there's you. gender inequality. We know about it and we don't like it. Yes. So the question is, of course, the burden is in the pandemic. The burden for, for females was much larger for many reasons. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, will this disappear? Yes, thank you. Yes. So let me develop the inequality in terms of gender, actually. So if you look at uh, numbers, we see that women actually make 39% of global employment. That's how much they are employed in the workforce. But actually, when it came to job losses, 54% job losses were of women.
so clearly we see that despite women making only 39% of the global employment, 50, 54% actually lost. So what is this telling me? This is telling me that women have been employed both in formal and in informal sector. And the losses are going to be really high for women because what, what the pandemic has actually highlighted is that it has, that the burden of uh, unpaid care has actually increased on women. And what has also happened is that women has been very disproportionate, women have been disproportionately hit because they were employed primarily in service sectors. And those were the ones which actually got hit. Now, we see that employment is actually really, women's employment is um, nose diving compared to male employment. So one can see very interesting um, contrasts. Let me give you two examples, one of the US and the other of India. So in the US, we see that women actually make up 46% of workers before COVID-19. Now, when we, fit, when we factor in industry mix effects, we see that women actually made up for 43% of job losses. But if now, if we look at um, India, very interesting to see that in India, women only make up just one fifth of the total workforce. But what has happened is as a result of the industry mix uh, shift, we find that 23% of overall job losses have happened uh, in uh, when we look from the gender lens. So clearly we see that women have been disproportionately impacted negatively as a result of COVID and the inequality has increased not only in terms of incomes, but also in terms of gender inequality. Yeah, so, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Sangeeta said that, uh, yes, we um, looked at our uh, farm level data and in both the permanent workers and temporary workers, women were more laid off. This is the uh, same for both uh, advanced countries, developing countries across different regions. This is what happened. And this is not only a um, uh, short period of uh, impact, because if you lose a job to, to shoulder the uh, household work, unpaid household work, and so on, then uh, you interrupt your career. That will have a long term implications on women's uh, uh, success in, in their careers. Thank you. More, more not on this inequality. I mean, is an important issue. If not, we have a, another, uh, we're running out of time soon, but we have another important issue, policies. Yes, I mean, we all heard from uh, of, uh, by, by Francois that we uh, cannot see a uh, um, uh, big impact of uh, the measures taken currently. Uh, um, that's often what, uh, what, what, if you're a longer observer of uh, what governments do in crises, is uh, have the right projects available, which make a long-term impact. Uh, so it's more kind of a Keynesian program to bring people into work. I'm not saying that's bad, but it's, I'm just saying that it's not often not possible to, to use the crisis for uh, a change because the projects that driving um, a change um, are, are not uh, not are not on the table. Yes, so that's certainly. But the other possibility is to to, to train people, um, um, uh, education, uh, skilling, retraining. Um, but also in crisis, is often you don't think that you you think if people have time, they could retrain, but they don't do it. Where are the, where are the problems on these issues? I mean, what is Ilo saying already on all this? Francois, Francois, I think wants to intervene, please. Oh, okay. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Aurelio. Um, no, I mean, this, in those uh, sort of recovery uh, packages, trackers, they've developed uh, taxonomies to, to understand what's in them and, and what's green. And uh, if I list some of these categories, I think it, it helps to see what uh, what's there and what could be the, the jobs of tomorrow. So basically you will have, you know, energy, uh, so renewable production, but also energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, so buildings and construction. Uh, transport, so um, electric vehicle productions and, uh, you know, more cycle path and, and things like that. 
natural capital box. I mean, we, we can think mental health during the lockdown and people reconnecting with, with parks and so on, and research and development. And what, what I find, you know, interesting is that it, maybe 10 or 20 years or 30 years ago, you could say, okay, the tech is not here, so the projects are not ready. But now it's, it's big, a lot of the technologies is here ready to be deployed. Uh, renewable power generation is cheap. Uh, electric cars, okay, you still have problems, but the main problem is to uh, develop the infrastructure. So a lot of these uh, green policies that have been put on the table are actually uh, close to shovel ready to, to, to connect to what, to what you were saying, Klaus. Now, probably not all of them, and that's part of the reason it's too small, but um, um, nevertheless, there are some proposals out there. Yeah, I, it, yes, if, I yeah if, I, if I may, I, I, I would like to add to the list uh, submitted by Francoise, because I think what is particularly important in my view is in the uh, recovery program that actually are ambitious just for a few, you know, quite advanced and rich countries. So for many other, for reason of lack of fiscal space and many other reasons, the ambition is really not there uh, so far. But for the countries we embark really on, you know, strong recovery packages, the sectors that are uh, targeted and should be targeted are also sectors like the care economy, uh, broadly defined, like the health sector, the education sectors, but also the social protection system in terms of, you know, uh, uh, overcoming the gaps that have been very clear because of the, of the COVID pandemic. And I think this is quite important because this sector creates jobs huh? and are part of the response to the inequality we were discussing before, so that they provide some countervailing, you know, uh, force uh, against the inequality trends that we have been discussing. So I think it will be important that, you know, we don't forget those, those sectors. I think the, the, the Biden administration and the, the large part that the, uh, support to childcare, uh, and, 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 uh, and other social services, uh, plays, uh, is a quite good example of this new approach. So this is building a sustainable future of work and then, uh, in concrete terms. Well, th well, thank you to the previous speakers. You've touched on very important issues. I think we have to remember that governments and uh, businesses have to work in partnership because only when they work in partnership, this is going to build a strong and an interconnected ecosystem, which has to be committed to upskilling because now, upskilling and reskilling is what has to be brought onto the table, and that cannot be done just by governments. We have to make sure that there is strong partnership between education providers, between businesses, and and with the government. And I think this there is going to be a lot of need to think about innovation in content, in terms of delivery, in terms of financing, in terms of actually developing public-private partnerships. Thank you. We cannot your hear you, is, Klaus. Yes, your voice is breaking a bit. You might need to uh, refresh your tap. That might help. There, there were two questions. Um, or three questions or comments in the q a maybe if klaus uh you will find out if you can manage the audio at the same time the presenters could take a look on those okay kathy if i made this there's one question on the state as the largest employer and the increased reliance on uh, uh, new technologies in the public sectors. Uh, let me just sort of respond briefly that actually this uh, uh, e-government, if you can call that, is one of the positive impact of you know, uh, digitalization and new technology on, on for developing countries, because they're quite example. I mean, India has been really gung-ho on these issues, 
but other countries from Bangladesh uh, to many other countries, Togo, Senegal, uh, a number of African countries, of course, Rwanda and others, uh, really introduce uh, you know, new uh, information technology in the way in which public policy is uh, uh, implemented with some, some benefits in terms of you know, increased accountability, transparency, but also as well as increased delivery. So there's some opportunities there that we should be looked at and, and they are quite important. Uh, uh, in my, in my so can you hear me? I'm I'm back. Uh, it seems that I had some technical problems. Uh, Sanchita, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sanchita, please, uh, yes, please go. Yes. Yeah, so, so I I think it's really as you rightly alluded to. Uh, organizations actually now will have to coach their managers and leaders how to manage remote working because there is a major shift that has happened in transparency, in trust, and dynamic work patterns. So I think, again, going back, this has to be some kind of a partnership for us, for the world to come out of the hole that we've got into at the moment. Thank you. Nabuya, you have something to say? Yes, thank you, Klaus. Uh, uh, as for digitalization for low-income countries, uh, especially, it is important for them to invest in uh, basic infrastructure, digital infrastructure, because without uh, broadband, it's very hard to uh, um, do remote work and, 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 and develop the uh, uh, advanced technology production. So it is important to have fast uh, um, basic inf infrastructure and, and, and also uh, training, um, especially uh, for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. And as for sustainability, as Francois said that, uh, um, yes, we are probably making more efforts recent years, but that would, would not be enough. Uh, yes, during the pandemic, we saw the uh, around 8% CO2 decline, but in order to reach Paris Agreement, we, are, we have to reduce 8% every year until <laughs> 2050. So this is a massive uh, worldwide project and we have to uh, further accelerate to, to meet this goal. And we witnessed the uh, policy, actually we talked about policy, uh, policy formulation process suffered during the pandemic, especially uh, developing countries government, they had a few uh, interactions with uh, stakeholders and they had to do uh, uh, more desk work and, and and so on. So we have to have more uh, uh, inclusive, participatory uh, policy for formulation process by interacting with all the uh, relevant stakeholders and making sure interministerial coordination. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have exhausted the questions from the audience? Uh, I maybe Aurelia. Yes, you you will have sent more or less the last word. Oh, no, sorry. Just one, again, on the digital opportunity, uh, where we're doing some work, and I think it's particularly important for low-income countries, is on the informal sector. So there are tools that can have the progressive transition to formalization. And we, we for example, electronic recording of transaction in Mexico, payroll platform for small micro-businesses in Peru, domestic work uh, registration in Uruguay, health insurance application in Ghana, digital labor inspection schemes in Argentina, et cetera, et cetera. There's quite a lot of kind of grassroots, you know, uh, pilot initiative and experimentation that could really, you know, provide some push to the process of formalization. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, our task was uh, impossible, an impossible challenge to speak to, to deal with this uh, very uh, important question uh, within 45 minutes. Um, but we have seen a number of very interesting insights. I thank you very much all the uh, wonderful speakers um, and uh, thank you for the interactions and cooperation. And of course, we have to thank all the uh, people listening to us, uh, it's a large crowd, as I see, and um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of this wonderful conference. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.